I'd love to, I'd like, you really want to still enjoy your job. But outside of that, it's oh, about freedom and flexibility. Time, yeah. Getting yourself to a point that you can dictate your day mm -hmm. and you've got enough money and enough control over your life. But now they've obviously given like self-employed visas, golden visas, investor visas. Mm -hmm. It's like you can now even retire here if you want to. Yeah, so, they've opened up a lot more. You can freelance yeah. like in terms of, you know, it de depends. There's a lot more opportunity to be out here for the longer term and to create a home. Welcome back to another episode of the Property by Kazi podcast. Uh, this time we're working on the weekend. New set, we are overseas with a man himself. I would call him Peter, would call him Mr. Blemming, but for those that really know him, it's Mr. No Days Off. How you doing, brother? Good, bro. You good? Good. So this is a man, he's a serious man, suit and a coffee. That's how you know he means business. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking all things Dubai real estate. That's from how, if people want to transition from the UK to Dubai, the skill set that you need, the kind of money that you can make, the trials, the tribulations, the ups, the downs. Um, but before we dive into all of that, like give the people a little bit of your background. Pre coming to Dubai, what did you do? So I worked in real estate in the UK. I worked for three main companies mm. being there. Um, if I start like where I started mm. at, uh, Peter James. Mm -hmm. It's actually now been bought by Dexter's um, based on Lee High Road, just on the corner next to the Sainsbury's. I started there on like a 9K basic. Mm. Like, it was ridiculous. Like if I didn't make money, I'm getting paid £750 a month. I'm not even yeah. getting taxed. That's how low it was. Obviously, it was an entry. So I was doing sales and leasing, um, and I loved it straight away. So I got into that. that Can I ask you, like, what was it that made you want to get into that space? Like, because how old were you when you started? Can I say, like, 22? Did you just want to wear a suit? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You know what? My uncle took me to a property okay. acquisition seminar. Okay. And from there, I was just gassed on property in general. Yeah. And then I got a good friend, Louis. His yeah. dad owns a estate agent. And I was working as an accountant at the time doing insolvency. So something completely different, corporate, all the rest of it. Um, and I said, get me an interview mm. just because I wanted to get into the space. Got me an interview, obviously not got me the job. Um, and yeah, they offered me the job. I literally cut my salary in half, but it was an opportunity to work in something I was really interested in. And then, yeah, just took it from there. So that's it. So you was there. Then where so did you go there, after that? Yeah, I was there for a year and a half. Then I went Canary Wolf. Mm -hmm. I was in Canary Wolf for a company called Chase Evans. Chase Evans, like... To me at the time was like, you're coming from Southeast London, trying to sell and, and rent flats in like Catford and Hiver mm. Green and places like that to Canary Wharf, which is big city, mm. big lights. And the company had overseas offices in Singapore, I think Beijing as well. Mm -hmm. And they used to get overseas investors to just buy like multiple apartments yeah. and a lot of new buildings in Canary Wharf. Canary Wharf was very up and coming at the time. So I went there around 2012, which was the time of the Olympics. Yeah. And we just had stock. So I've come from somewhere that I'm just out here trying to hunt for stock. Yeah. And they just had unlimited stock. Um, I was just doing lettings there. They gave you company car. They gave you mobile phone. They gave you petrol allowance. It was just like a completely different setup. So I was there for just under two years. Loved it at the time. But it's just commuting into Canary Wharf every day was just a lot. And again, you're always looking up for me anyway. After two years, I'm always looking about what's my next mm. step. The sales market at that time in Canary Wharf was dead. Yeah. Um, the leasing market, I felt like I got to the top of it. So then I started looking at things closer to home. So I went for another interview. I actually went for an interview years ago um, at KFH, so Kenny yeah. Folk and Haywood. Um, went to go and meet Junior Peak, regional director. He was like, I know an, a perfect manager for you. So I went to go and meet Tyrone, mm. Crystal Palace. And me and T just clicked straight away. Shout out Tyrone, Come man. On. Shout out Tyrone, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Do um, some business. Let me know if you've got some deals for me, Ty, man. We're still looking. <laughs> jokes. Um, that was actually 10 years this month. Wow. 2014 Jan. I remember I went to Vegas oh. for New Year's. Mad, isn't it? That's Vegas crazy. New Year's. Come back. Started the new job. And Crystal Palace. Um... KFH at the time, the market was crazy, yeah. like crazy. It was like, we weren't even doing viewings during the week. We was doing open days on the weekend. So we're yeah. going out and obviously we're valuing, we're putting a price, we're, we're um, agreeing a structure with the owner in terms of like, if we can get X amount over, mm -hmm. can we take like 10 or 20% of what we get over? It was a crazy market. Literally doing open days on the weekend and you're seeing 10, 20, 30, nearly 50 people queued you know up around what? the corner. Do you remember this market? I'm getting mad flash, but I can, like, I can name the properties that we were going through. See? Like that we're going through like the Gennaro Rolls, the Central I'm gonna, I, I was going to jump on this later, but yeah, don't worry. I'm yeah, touch no, still. because that was a... But I think the sign of a good agent is someone who can operate in any market because there's always going to be peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. So 
That then, was sorry yeah. to jump in, but people always look at markets like that and think, "Oh my god, you must be loving it." The market's yeah. on fire. No, because it's like owners get unrealistic expectations, mm. buyers are getting nervous, um, the price is just getting out of control. Mm. So no matter what market you're looking at, it's always going to be difficult. There's like a sweet spot in between mm -hmm. that everything's all good, both sides are happy, yeah. and then either side it's just you're always battling on one side. But um, yeah, done that 2014. I was there, like you were saying, obviously, Genoa Road, them days. But yeah, open houses, around the corner, 50 yeah. people. People have literally got five to 10 minutes inside the property. They're giving them offer letters at the front. They're offering over no. the weekend. You're sitting there on a Monday, you've got like 10 offers, 15 offers in each property. Got and sealed bids, giving it to owners. So that market was good. That year was really good. So we become one of the top offices. Because you were like in a million pound office for a long time, like for a that while. That was the first year we hit it. So um, there was a lot of other yeah. million pound offices, but Crystal Palace, like Ty took over Crystal Palace mm. and he, he grew that into a beast. So I remember we was in Barcelona. Mm. So we won the trip to go Barcelona. Yeah. And we're sitting in Barcelona when our last exchange went through and wow, yeah. You see, end of the year office. when you were trying to get to that million. Yeah. If you're the vendor and you're delaying something, ah, oh, the headache Pressure. I would be getting <laughs> is unmatched. Pressure, literally. Um, so you were there. 2014, 2015, still a good market. Mm -hmm. And then coming into 2016, it started to turn. So like Brexit, elections, everything. It just mm -hmm. really started to slow down. The market weren't looking too great. Um, and I went on holiday to Dubai. So I went on holiday to Dubai. The day I got there, um, Dan Lawrence mm. <laughs> messaged me. I put up a little <laughs> snap on Instagram. Bro, I just accepted the job out in Dubai. You should look into it at the time. I never thought of it. The mm -hmm. first time I, I went, um, I had my cousin that lived out here and I had two friends, Holly and Fabian, that mm -hmm. lived out here. So me and the boys came out on holiday. Dan hit me, um, set up an interview for the next day. When I met the, the directors, I had no intentions for an interview. So I've turned them like t-shirt, jeans, mm -hmm. and I think them times they were wearing loafers. That was like the best, that was the best you could do on literally, short notice. Literally, <laughs> literally. Um, it was a very informal chat, mm -hmm. um, going through my history, etc., And they offered me the job on the spot. So I thought, let me just not make the decision until I get back home. Because obviously first time in Dubai, you've seen all these, again, bright lights. And I'd never been before. And it was, yeah, it was a really good holiday. Because um, that kind of, it almost segues very nicely into what I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. So your move to Dubai, it was based off experience and enjoying the city, you didn't have any plans to move prior. So I had no plans to move prior, but I knew you were going to ask me, why did I move to Dubai? Yeah. You. <laughs> me? You. I knew you were going to be expect this. You. You and Alex. Oh my God. So we're going back to what you I did. Where my, I don't know what he's about to say. <laughs> but if it's bad, I didn't do it. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. But um, Genoa Road, mm. Wavell Place, mm. Sydenham Road. All of these flips we mm. was involved in. So just to kind of bring it back, you was obviously a client, yeah. finding option, Pete found me an option where mm. you started was buying, finding a one bed with a separate kitchen, mm. converting that into an open plan living area with a kitchen, yeah. adding a bedroom, flipping it. But obviously the market was behind you as mm. well. Do you know Road, I think you bought that for 250? I think you yeah. sold it for 350. Yeah, I, feel, I don't even know if it was that. I think it might have been a bit lower, but yeah, it was a It was, it a was like 100K plan. in it. Obviously yeah. you have finances. Yeah. So I saw that, I was like, Ooh, Mm -hmm. Sydenham Road. <laughs> Sydenham Road was the one that made me think, oh my God, you bought the whole building. And I think, I can't remember how much you bought it for. I think you bought it for like I think the, the, 500, 600? No, bro. The building, I bought the whole building for 420. <laughs> See, split into three flats. So, uh, Sydney, no, Sydney, so Sydney Road was whole building for four, well, whole building for 420, but I still bought separate flats. They were already flats. Refurbed them as two flats that I think sold for... 460 and 350. So. And I remember the 460 one got downvalued. Yeah. To like 400 or something like that. And, but because of the market was so, like, so booming. Mm. And like you just said, that was a case of open house. And we might have only had 20 people through the door. But the bids But we just... had 14 offers all above asking. Yeah. So going best and final. And it, yeah, went from, I think we put it on the market for 400. Ended up selling it for 460, got down valued because that was at the time, even if you go now for Sydenham Road, it was almost on the high street, you know. Price, yeah. And then you got another valuer in. No, so yeah. they no, they made I think we tried to get another valuer in and they were kind of similar, but the buyer wanted it so bad that we're like, look, we've got cash buyers sitting behind you. We've got people with 50% deposits. 
I think they managed to find and make up the difference. And they still proceeded. And they still it? proceeded, yeah. Anyway, that one. And then the last <laughs> straw was Central Park. Central Park, I found these lot, this, um, it was like, it was derelict. Like, yeah, it was bad. It was a probate. Mm. Uh, it hadn't been touched for like 20, 30 years. I remember we closed it at 466. Six. Yeah. They renovated it, turned it around in about six months mm. and sold it for 655. Yeah. And that one there, I was like, I need to get in. And it still flew as well. It flew. And it didn't have no yeah. garden. It had like a roof terrace. A done a very, very Roof terrace was the size of this table. Yeah, it was tiny. Yeah. <laughs> it was tiny. Um, but it still went. And that that was the one that I was like, I need to get involved. Yeah. And then obviously I'm looking, thinking about obviously how like I had a deposit to buy an, a, mm. a flat, mm. but I'm not gonna be able to do what you lot yeah. was doing at that time. Um then Dubai come up and obviously talking to Dan, how much can you earn, etc. Mm-hmm. etc. I came to Dubai with that plan, be here for two years, mm. save enough money to go home and do that. Mm-hmm. That was the plan. Um, so obviously set a job in April, came out in August. Mm-hmm. And obviously every single month I'm ringing Dan that, how much you make this month? Mm. How much and he's giving me the, the low down. Then a week before I was supposed to come, bro, my, my flatmates just moved out. Do you want to move in with me? So I've just slipped straight in. Mm. And obviously where he's already kind of learned the job a little yeah. bit, he like, like, I don't know. Obviously I still would have done well, I think. Um, but being having Dan there yeah. definitely helped. And we talk about this in uh, the mentoring space, in uh, just having people around you that are doing similar things, having a sounding board. Because sometimes you might know the right things, but you just need someone to tell you, do you know what? You know, that makes sense. You know what you're talking about. And just that confidence of maybe people that have made the mistakes before you, that you don't have to make them again. So it can save you a lot of money, particularly if you're in the property space, whether it's working in property or as an investor, Mm -hmm. it it costs money, whether that be time, money, et cetera, and being able to save those things. Is a, is a big deal. So your move, I guess, was very streamlined. But since then, you've seen obviously probably tens, hundreds of people move. What's the process like from from, from a from somebody that wants to move over to Dubai? How simple is it? It can be very simple. I think people overthink it a bit. Um, but the main thing is having is two things: is having enough savings to cover you until you're able to make some money. I was lucky enough, Mm. I hit the ground running. So Mm. the first month earned, second month Mm. earned, and like progressively kept on earning uh, throughout my Mm. career. Had loads of calls, but the first six months, which I think is probably the most essential, I was quite steady and quite, um, what's the word on it, consistent. Um, But I think it's one, the savings, it's two, getting sucked into the lifestyle when you first get in. Because it is an unreal place to be if you've got money. It's very easy to do a lot of things. There's a lot more things to do than there is in London or anywhere else in the world. And especially if you're a young person as well, why would you not go out? But yeah. a lot of people kind of, you need to prioritize your work first and do that secondary. Because I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, the structure in Dubai in terms of pay structure is pretty different and we'll move on to that. But would you say to kind of be comfortable, would you say you need an amount in savings? And if so, how yeah, much would you say I think you that would need to... Depends if you're a guy or girl, depends on your lifestyle, depends on what you want to do. But I think like operating costs... For someone moving out here, I don't think you should be spending more than, say, two to two and a half grand a month. Mm. And I think you need at least six months. You need to go into this mm. thinking I'm not going to make money for six months for this to be able to work. So obviously you break that down. Yeah, to like 15K. 15, just, I think you don't necessarily need it, but it's security to depending have, on your attitude you towards flapping. risk. When your money starts coming down, yeah. that's when you start acting a little bit different in terms of negotiation, in terms of obviously trying to find buyers and, and sellers and... You just want to be as comfortable as possible so you're not, you haven't got that pressure on you and that's when you'll perform the best. Because I think that's it from a sales perspective. Like on my side, like I obviously operate on the other side. Mm. When I'm dealing with an agent, you can almost tell they need this need, deal. Yeah. You lose faith that are they actually operating looking and out, talking with integrity. And looking out for your best interest. Yeah. 100%. So I think, and people can see that. Even if, it's, even if you're trying not to convey it, mm. if you're in an uncomfortable position, I think for a lot of people, it's very hard to be then comfortable in your work-life balance across the board. So you actually, you said what? You answered, Peach is flying, you know. My questions that are in my phone, I try and get to them. He's already answering them because he already said, oh, is this, this, is, this is why he's just preempting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because again, we were talking about topics and yeah. I was like, I don't have to worry about topic. I know it will just flow. Yeah. That conversation with you is easy. Nah. So, but you answered in that you said you were kind of closing first deals first month out here. Would you say that's normal? How long does it take a lot of people to kind of... Because I know very, very good brokers Mm. 
that have taken six months and they haven't mm. done any, any deals. And did you go straight into sales or straight letting? Straight into leasing. So, so at the time yeah. that I came, sales was non-existent. Yeah. Honest with you, like, it wasn't the market for sales. Yeah. It was the market for leasing. Mm -hmm. So everyone kind of at that time went into leasing. And I think like once you've done really, really well in leasing, then you'll start focusing on the sales and take that risk. But for the first two to three, maybe even four years that I was here, it was definitely more of a leasing, leasing. And again, just to kind of break that down further, we'll go into this maybe a little mm. bit later as well, but like I'd say when I came 80% of, just in my area, mm. so I, I cover an area called Jamiro Golf Estates mm. and Victory Heights, 80% of the properties that was owned in these areas were investors that were just renting them out. 20% mm. was owner occupied, where now I think it's turned on its head. Mm -hmm. So obviously the sales market is going to be a lot busier now because obviously there's more end users that are looking where mm -hmm. before the, the rental market would be the busier market because there's more options that mm -hmm. are there for rent. And people didn't really, people would come here with a short term goal. People wouldn't come here to be here long term. Yeah. So therefore, you're only going to rent. People yeah, the only adopter, early adopters, the early expats, everybody like had a two year plan. It was two year, you know, really nice place, going to come for a little while, going to earn my money yeah. because of tax, etc and I'm going to go back. And people were getting paid a massive amount because they're being compensated for coming out here. It's like mm. the equivalent of being flown out to Saudi or Kuwait mm. or somewhere mm -hmm. like that now. That isn't really the place to go. You're having to give people these packages of high salaries, um, school allowance, um, flights home a year, and all the rest of it. Now they don't really need to do that because people want to be here. That's the difference. And in terms of like the culture of like the way in which the business works, mm. like... How do you think that differs from being an agent in the UK, or do you think, or do you think it's very similar? No, I think it's very different. Um, couple differences. Everything in the UK is usually on an exclusive basis. Mm -hmm. Out here, it's becoming more exclusive, but it's it's like owners don't really care who they use mm -hmm. to, to kind of sell or rent their property. Main reason is because they don't pay fees. Mm -hmm. In the UK, you pay fees as an owner. Here, mm -hmm. the buyer pays the fees. So for the owner, it's like, bring me the best offer. Mm -hmm. I don't really care who brings it because the, the client's obviously paying you. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, it's more about exclusive. Um, the difference as well, I think agents maybe aren't as hungry because they get a basic. Mm -hmm. The commission isn't the bigger chunk of what you're getting paid. So people are a little bit more, they're not as hungry, but out here it's commission only. So it's yeah. like, if you don't work, if you don't close, you're not getting paid. So, so is that the standard across the board? Like 100%. everyone's on commission Everyone only? Everyone's on commission only. There may be small exceptions, but mm. if they're on, say, a basic, it means they get a lower tier commission. Me mm. personally, I don't know why anyone would do that if you're a good agent because mm. you would want to get more commission because you sell more. And what, what's the commission structure out here? Like, I'll get, it's obviously going to differ, Different. but how does it differ from the UK as well? Again, so UK, you'd be like average 20K basic for mm. the year. You'd be on 8 to 10% up to a certain tier, then 20%, then 30% mm. max. I've seen that. But yeah, in terms of just to break that down for people who are not familiar, that 8% isn't 8% of the sales price. No, That's 8% the of, the, of the fee. So say they, average yeah. again, say your fee is between 1.5 mm. and 2% of the, the sole mm. price, then the agent would get paid 8 to 10% of mm. that. Mm -hmm. Then 20% if they was to hit, I don't know, 100 or 150K for the company for the yeah. year, and then 30% over, I don't know, 250. This is just what yeah, just. I remember. Here, average 50%. Mm -hmm. And it, well, obviously commission only. Yeah tiered up to 60 in like a well-established um, company uh, for a senior. And then there's a lot of companies out here now starting up that are offering agents up to 80%, but they're not really like established companies. You don't get no training, you don't have no team. Mm. It's just kind of like you're sucking an umbrella company. So you're kind of working for yourself. You're almost, yeah, like that sort of self-sufficient. But you don't really have to do anything. So yeah. it's a good, good business model, but that's only really for really experienced brokers that feel like they've already established themselves. They don't want to set up their own company, so therefore they'll just use the the what's been set up by that company and just do their own thing. So that's the difference. But again, if we break down the difference, 10%, 8, 8 to 10%, plus getting taxed compared to 50% tax-free, I know what I know. Yeah, like if we did like random, like random numbers, so for example, if you say you're selling a flat for £400,000, at 1%, 1.5% commission, you're looking at 6,000. So if you're getting 10% of that, you're looking at a five to 600 pound commission, then you get taxed. Then you get taxed. Over so here, what kind of are we looking at for? So for that, you're three, 3,000 pounds. So that's, and in terms of, if you look at it relatively, 10 per that's, that's the monthly wage off the one deal. So it's, it's very much a performance-based industry, 100%. but you do the deals, 
And yeah, you, you can get paid. again agents that do well and get mm. paid well. Five percent of the industry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that are doing very averagely. There's a lot of that are just getting by, but there's like some people making some life changing money out there because they're, they're committed. And what do you think it takes to make a good agent in Dubai? Like, what skills do you think, like, if you've got that kind of skill set, you're going to perform? Patience. It's number one. <laughs> very, very uh, stressful <laughs> job. Patience. Um, honesty. That's one thing um, Ty taught me years ago. It was that if you don't lay, uh, sorry, if you don't lie, you don't ever have to remember. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that one. Um, and consistency. Mm -hmm. Consistency is a main thing. Like you literally need to wake up every morning and just keep going, keep going, keep going. It can literally change. I literally say it all the time. It can all change in a day because mm -hmm. it's very fast paced out here as well. You can literally get a call right now, go and do the viewing in an hour. You can close by this evening, make 10,000 pounds. Crazy. And that's the thing as well. It's the price points because obviously London is very expensive as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, in terms of the number of those expensive properties, Whereas Dubai, every time I see a new listing, I'm looking at something else that I can't afford. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on over it in terms of price. So when we look at like the market from 20, so the market dropped in 2008. Mm. It then peaked all the way up to 2014. It then dropped all the way down to 2020. We're now back at the peak prices of 2014. But the space that has grown since 2020 till now, some communities have tripled in price. Mm. That people have made a lot of money, but they made that money accidentally. They didn't yeah. plan to be here at this point. Like people buying houses for a million pounds and that's worth three million pounds. Mm. But again, they're buying it as a home. So it's like, yeah, great. It's gone up by this amount. But if I sell, where do I go? Yeah, where do I move? I either that? have to downsize my lifestyle or I need to believe that the market's going to drop. So I'll move into rented, cash in and then just wait for it to drop again. So it's a bit of a mad market at the moment. But yeah, price wise, but you say that. Because if you compare it to London, the size of what you're getting for these properties. So like you're looking at, let's give an example, yeah. two bed in Marina right now. Yeah. What's the square footage? Like 1,500 square feet? Yeah, like I think between fifteen to 1,800 square it's foot. the size of a three bedroom house in Wimbledon that's going for a million quid. Yeah. So it's like the size that you're getting for that money is still not, because people are like, oh my God, it's hit a peak. It's going to crash. It's too expensive. When you compare it to the rest of Europe, it's actually still like not expensive. Yeah, still relatively, relatively affordable in terms of when you put it in comparison to the prices in Paris, even like Paris, New York, London, Barcelona, like 100%. LA, some of the most expensive places to be. Mm. And it is one of the most now desirable cities to be in. So it's, I'm not saying it's at that level in terms of like all around, but in terms of where people want to be for a number of different reasons. And again, with the people relocating in. So as much as the people here have seen the prices tripling in price over the last four years, there's people coming in and are saying, well, I get this for this price. Mm. I'll sell my, my place back home and I'll buy that. So it's just as much as someone might think it's expensive, there's someone right behind them that actually mm. are going to So for you, when you're speaking to not just the owner occupiers, but also the investors, mm. you're still saying that, you know, it represents good value for money in terms of 100%. investment opportunities. Even, even more so for an investor um, because of the yield. So the yields, you're, you're hitting a minimum of 6%, averagely 8%. I'm seeing people that are getting 10% yields. And that's just on straightforward rental. That's Straight. not even to talk about not the short Airbnb term, option, short-term short rentals as well. It and renting it out. Obviously, that's quite rare. Mm -hmm. But especially the people, as I said, that I bought five, um, four years ago, the prices have doubled. Mm -hmm. So say you bought for a million pounds, that same house is now renting out for 200,000 pounds a year. That's ridiculous. So it's like... It's still a very good investment going forward. You get where I'm coming from. So it just depends kind of what people's plans are when you're thinking to sell against. So as an end user, if you're buying it as your family home, you're going to be there for the next five to 10 years. As long as you can afford it right now, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much it's gone up. So areas, I know this is, this is, this is an interesting question for you. It's going to be biased. Go on. It's, good, it's going to be biased. So you can talk about, you know, your areas. But if you were to give me, give me your... Okay, we're going to do it separately. Mm. Give me your top three areas to invest. Mm. And then for you, just top three areas that you like. So we can we can break it down. That's the top three areas to invest in in Dubai right now. Um, JVC as mm -hmm. an apartment. I think it's a very up and coming area. I think for the size of property you get, the fact that they're all quite new, the location getting into most central areas is quite good. I think it's a very, very good investment. As I said, I've seen investors that are making 10 to 12% on their investments at the moment on short term, 8 to 10% on long term. I think mm -hmm. that's a bit. And again, 
depending on what buildings you're buying in, but there's a lot of buildings that are built by a developer called Ellington. Mm-hmm. Ellington was started by the ex CEO, I think it was, um, of Emar, which is one of the biggest developers out in Dubai. Huge. Um, and he just kind of took all the good things out of Emar, put them into Ellington. They've got really good finishes, really good sizes, and they've built a lot of low rise apartment buildings that are only four floors. There's not many in the building, and they're very sought after. So, buildings like that, I think, is a very good investment. Expo City. I've seen a lot of people mm. invest in there. I think um, that's got a lot of growth to come. I feel like that's the new JVC, say where JVC was three years ago. Um, and Dubai Hills. I think Dubai Hills is a very, very good area. It's an EMAR community. It's massive and it's got a lot of space behind it. So it's just continuing to grow. But it's got lots of parts, a lot of cafes. It's got a mall there. It's got everything you would need for a family. So you'll see a lot of expats go in there. And I think that's just going to continue to go up in price. Okay, then you, My favorites. you, your favorite places, whether it's, you could, you could give us the reasons why or you can not, we need three favorite places um, in Dubai area wise. Um, I'm going to start with villa areas just because mm. I'm a villa specialist. Mm. So Jumeirah Golf Estates is my area. I think it's amazing. Um, it's built on the world championship golf course, uh, very family orientated, mm. very Western, uh, beautiful properties all on the golf course, amazing views. And then now being renovated quite a lot as well. So you're getting really high-end renovations being done because, as I said, you've got this clientele coming in from outside, in from Switzerland, from the UK, that are used to a certain level of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, renovation. Mm, um, standard. Standard, there we go. Mm. Um, and they're paying the premiums for it. So I think that's a very good area to the Palm. I don't think mm. you can ever beat the Palm. That I was there. Do you know what? I'm just, I'm so anti-Palm, but it's traffic. I'm that's anti-Palm. But you cannot be a villa on the palm. Yeah. Nah, like one you. of those villas on the palm, and they've been fully renovated on the beach, and you've got a full. Do, do you know what? Do you know what almost changed my mind on the palm? It's not actually being on the palm, but I think it's when I was like at, um, I can't even remember where it is. It's a restaurant, a nice restaurant, looks over the palm. And you know when you're looking down at the palm and you're like, different. is this real? It's like, it's, it's a different it's view. iconic. That's it. So I don't think you can be. Yeah. This is where the record prices are being set. That's where wealth is going. Like, mm-hmm. It's crazy. Um, free. This has changed over the last year. I never used to go down there. I didn't really rate it that much, but downtown Dubai yeah. is just DIFC. DIFC. <laughs> it's a different level of living, man. It's just... Do you know what? DIFC is for like, it's it's like DIFC. You've got the middle ground. You've got the old school Dubai yeah. and the really kind of new money. And that's where they merge. The kind of existing Dubai community. We're like, oh, I don't know about But it's, yeah, it's DIFC just, is... Uh, it's yeah, I think those three probably my favorite. Okay, so there are top three places in terms of where you like and where to invest. So definitely check them out. I'm going to make sure I put Pete's details in the description. So if you want to connect to him, if you're looking to invest. And to be fair to you, I think one thing that you've done really well outside of just outside of your, your day to day is building a really good contact base to contact base to be the kind of go to person for anything in property. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, like. Again, I specialize on one thing, mm-hmm. but I like to be seen as someone that if you've got a question, you can always ask. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like I've built up a network that no matter what you want to do or where you want to go, where you want to buy, I'll know the best person mm-hmm. that can help you with that. Like the amount of calls I get every day, like a guy called me yesterday, I want to open a nightclub, do you know anyone a commercial? Wow, I know that person. Yeah. I want to buy on the pump, this is the best person. I've got someone with a budget of a million dirhams, which is 200,000, I know someone. I've got a budget of 100 million, I know someone. So it's like, I feel I've pride myself on that. Um, and hopefully that obviously just, like we were talking about referral basis. Yeah. I think that's the best thing you can do as a salesman. Yeah. You're a businessman in, in general. And just having, that's why it's good to build up these, these contacts and these networks. Cause it's like, you can confidently recommend people as well. Like say for you, it's like someone says, oh, I need to buy a property. You know, you can confidently recommend yeah. me, vice versa. That's, do you see having somebody that's a go-to because you know that everybody's busy. Mm-hmm. So if someone's saying, I need an interior architect and I know one that's good. And all I've got to do is say, you know what? No problem. Phone this person and they're in safe hands. Yeah. I know that they're going to connect, you know, in, in 99 times out of a hundred, it's going to be a great relationship. And the, the what's going to be left in their mind is Kaz is the one that did that for me. Pete's the one that did that for me. So it's always sides, good. Yeah. And again, it just, there's nothing worse than recommending someone and they just, oh, Oh, he's not coming back to me. He gave me the wrong yeah. price. Uh, he gave me a bad service. It's, it's the worst. So, yeah, over time, you, you obviously you learn these lessons by making those mistakes. But so then, yeah, for I don't get like this might not necessarily be like your your direct area, but for 
an overseas investor, you know, a lot of the people that I do with are based in the UK. Do you know much about like what's the process? Like if you want to buy in Dubai, but you're not currently based out, what do you what do you need? Is it what level is it a hundred percent you have to pay cash? Is it fifty yeah, percent yeah. deposit? Where are you at? So it's um it's a case by case basis. Mm. Obviously, if you can pay cash, fine, mm. no problems. Um you can buy it as a as a uh, non resident, there's no issues mm. with that. You can still get a mortgage being in the UK. Mm-hmm. You just have to put up a bigger deposit. So it depends if you're self employed, if you're employed, who you're employed by, how long you've been there. But usually, yeah, fifty percent deposit and you can still buy here. But if you're looking to buy off plan, it doesn't matter. So off plan again, I think this is what kind of keeps the Dubai market alive because I don't think there's anywhere else that you can buy something off plan with no real checks and they're offering post handover pa- payment plans. Mm-hmm. So it's like people that don't even have the cash up front, you're given a staggered payment plan and you can still continue the payment plan after um, handover. So it's like you're not having to rely on finance because mm-hmm. that was something we was going to touch into as well in terms of like why we are here in the market, why I think Dubai has kind of stayed strong where a lot of markets around the world have kind of suffered over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. It's not reliant on finance. Like finance under 10 million dirhams, which is 2 million pounds, I think there's a lot of, not a lot of people, but you'll see more people that are having mortgages, but a lot of people are just cash. Mm. So you know, you're talking about interest rates, which are really, it's really affecting the, the market back in the UK. We don't really have that problem here. So again, it's like that person, that interest rates are high, I'm not going to buy right now. Cash buyer just behind it. How much you need? Like that's just how it's working at yeah. the moment. So yeah, but as a, as a overseas investor, that's why again, we're getting a lot of people kind of looking in because it's like, to buy something in the UK now, as an investor, what are we looking at as a return in terms of a yield? Four to five percent? Mm-hmm. Plus the taxes, you're, you're netting like three percent. Yeah. And before you- And that's with, with changes, yeah, in legislation, a lot of people are even in negative net because of- Because of all of these changes and these restrictions. And you used to be able to bank on the capital appreciation, so therefore you didn't mind that you weren't getting a big uh, uh, yield on it because it's going to go up- at, that's obviously slowed down now as well. So that people are now looking around thinking, where do I put my money? And I think that having interest rates high at the moment, people look at interest rates as they're high, so the whole market's dying. But remember, people have got money in savings at the moment and are giving them 5%. Yeah. So it's like, they'll just rather leave it in the bank because it's giving them a better return than it is buying property. But as soon as that interest rate drops, they're going to start looking, where can we put our, our money elsewhere? To buy real estate, you're getting that 8% return. So why would you not? It's good. So the market's doing really well. Mm. Let's go back to now. That's the investor side, you know, people buying homes, but back on the side of working in Dubai. Mm-hmm. You, you touched on the fact that maybe it's the top 5% mm-hmm. that make that make the big bucks. Mm-hmm. What would you say like a good, like if you're in real estate, whether it's sales, letting, you can maybe let me know the difference. But if you're doing well, what, what can people realistically make? Um, <laughs> so average, I'll give you targets. So mm-hmm. say like in my last company, target for the year would be 1.2 million dirhams. Mm-hmm. That'll work Which out. is, go on, what's that So you'd get 600,000 in your pocket. Mm-hmm. So 120,000 pounds for the year, mm-hmm. cash in your pocket. That's the, the, the target for an average mm-hmm. sales uh, broker, not a senior. Mm-hmm. For leasing, I think it's like 480 for the year. So therefore you're taking home like 50,000 pounds for the year. Top broker in my last company last year, I think put 8 million dirhams on the, on the board, being the senior. So he probably took home about 4.5 minutes, about a million quid. Top leasing, I think she done like a million. So she probably took home like 120,000 pounds. Mm. I've now started a new company. Should just change my perspective on everything. Because there are brokers that are making, not even life-changing money, like unheard of money. So like, Top broker in my company last year put 67 million dirhams on the board. So that's just, just you've got to break it down <laughs> for the people that don't understand the changes. If you put 67 million dirhams on the board, what do you see at the end of the year in your bank account? It's like six million quid minimum, depending on what percentage. And that's a lot of money. And I think when we talk about property investment and, you know, getting into property, I always have conversations with people that maybe, like, look, I don't have the capital startup right now. I maybe don't want to do X, Y, or Z isn't for me, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. You spoke about in the last company, people making a million pounds, like net. And that's unreal. Yeah. Like, that's unreal. That's like, I'm not taking that away from anyone. That's still... What do you get for that back home? What job do you go to to get? Realistically... I saw something that was like, you know, partners in like top tier financial companies are still taking home 
250, 350 is kind of yeah. the average. Yeah. So at something where you don't necessarily need the full, you know, um, undergrad, masters, etc., that you can use a skill set that realistically a lot of people have. God. I was going to say, but even after mm. that, so that one of the main reasons why I went into real estate, as I mentioned, I was at an accountancy firm mm. before. So I was actually in the insolvency. Mm. And I'm looking at, obviously, you're looking at the top guys in any field you're going to be in and think, this is where I'm trying to get to. So I'm looking at the mm. partners. And the partners, like you said, they're probably taking home like 250, 300, obviously, mm. dividends, et cetera. But that was their life. Mm. Like, you get in in the morning, they've been in at 6 a.m. Do you leave at night? They're there till 10 p.m. every single night. Yeah. That, literally, that is their life. And it's just like, do I really want to do that? That I couldn't see myself doing. But these brokers here, obviously, they had to put in the hours to get to where they are. But now they're at a point that they can dictate their, their, their days. And their yeah. that no, crazy. that I said, you know, you know, me, me and Pete, Pete, outside of my friend, business partner, associate, you know, Pete is also my, my doubles partner in paddle. <laughs> 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 I have to just put it out there. He loves it, God. He loves a paddle. But it's that you, in terms of doing that, and, you know, not everybody's already always available. So there's loads of different apps and things you can use to meet people, play with them. And when you're playing, like, during the day, you're meeting people that, yeah, that they're, fully available from 11 till four. I might have a meeting in the morning at 10. I might have another one at five, but throughout that, they're dictating their day, what they want to do, what they're up to. So you're meeting these people. When you're speaking to them, a lot of them are saying, I'm in the real estate space. I'm in this, I'm in that. And I think for me, when I look at why I would ever want to go into a specific area, it's to allow me to do what I want. I'd love to, I'd like, you really want to still enjoy your job. Yeah. But outside of that, it's role. about freedom and flexibility. Yeah, 100%. That's the real currency, right? Yeah. It's time. So it's like getting yourself to a point that you can dictate your day mm -hmm. and you've got enough money and enough control over your life that you can kind of do what you want. But um, yeah, just going back to like what you were saying about meeting people on a daily basis, like starting this new company mm -hmm. has just changed my way I look at real estate. Like real estate before was just getting in and booking appointments and and doing viewings to try and get offers, to try and close deals. Mm. And now these lots just kind of teach you to, it's all about relationships, it's all about your network. That's it. it's like my, my director was like, I want you to get out and meet as many as your previous clients as possible with no agenda. Just go and meet them, have a conversation with them. You'll be surprised how much they're doing that they never would have told you before because you never would have asked. Mm. And since doing that, I'm just, I'm meeting these guys and they're telling me these mad stories about what they're doing. I was just like, wow. Like, and I think that's, that's another thing in terms of, the Dubai culture, and obviously there is, there's a lot of money flowing in Dubai, a lot of people that have done very well, and then they come to Dubai after doing well as well. So you're meeting with people that have already, you know, quite at like a pinnacle of their career, and they can share that experience, expertise, but also opportunity with you. So I think it's a very good place to just surround yourself with opportunity. 100%. And people, I think like, no disrespect to London or not kind of talking it down, but just from what I've experienced, I think people are more open to talking to you. Like, you get into a lift out here, but morning, like, you don't get that in London, do you know what I mean? Like, people are just more open to kind of just sharing themselves and invite you around to their house and take you out for dinner. Mm. I don't know, it's just a, maybe because you're in the sun, 247, maybe because it's safer, maybe because everyone's come out with the same mentality in terms of like, this isn't their home. I, yeah. I was where we, you was and I didn't know anyone. So I don't mind helping you out, et cetera. But it's just people are a lot more open to helping you and, and kind of building with you, no matter what circle you've come from. You know come from. Well, you definitely, definitely sound like you're, you're an advocate spokesperson. <laughs> if they're, if Mr. DXB is anywhere in the building and they need someone <laughs> to just come and sell the bag, oh, just get on. this man in front of the camera because you're definitely loving it. How do you manage to stay focused in terms of keeping that agenda of furthering your career path and not getting caught up in the glitz and glamour of Dubai? Um, it hasn't been a smooth journey. There's been ups and downs. I've made those mistakes that I'm telling people not to make. And luckily I got through the other side, you know what I mean? So I think just knowing, being at the bottom, and knowing what that feels, like you never want to go back there again. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to sit here thinking about how I'm going to pay rent. You don't want to sit here thinking, oh my God, I need this deal to go through. And it's just like going through that, you kind of then prepare yourself that no matter what's going on, work is always going to be the priority. As I said, it's a place that every single day of the week, there's something to do, there's somewhere to go. Every single week, there's someone on holiday, even though you're not on holiday anymore because you're a resident, but um, just there's always distraction, mm -hmm. should I say. So I think it's just kind of prioritizing your day-to-day. -day. This is what comes first after you've done all of that. Okay, cool. Then we can do the rest. So... I think it's just trial and error, but it's just trying to stay focused. And I think as well, I'm lucky 
that I've got a lot of people that I grew up with back in the UK that live here. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't really need to, I don't need to socialise, I don't need to make friends. I kind of like, I'm in my circle of quite grounded people as well. So definitely the people that are around me, like I've got my my cousin that I grew up with, my older I cousin. So as soon as I start losing myself, she'll be like, what are you doing? Like, do you know what I mean? So I think it's, it's definitely changed. Like I think it's very easy to get caught up in it. I know that like, it's been a long time now, first coming out here, things about, What's going on? Who's performing? What clubs happening? What yeah. day parties happening? Whereas now it's do you want to play tennis? Do you want to go bowling? Having a barbecue. Like, the have a barbecue. Yeah. Are we going for a Sunday roast? It becomes more of a home. And I think for a long time, a lot of people's like you said touched on the buyer was that holiday destination, that short term, that pit stop. Mm. Whereas now it's really become people's home. I'm like, okay, I can she talking to a friend the other day. Um and they're now sitting here and thinking, I'm going to be here for the next 10 years. And they can actually plan that. And like, even forget to, I know people have already been here next 10 years and are planning their next 10. There we go. And it's like before it wasn't, you couldn't think of doing that because you could only be here if you was on a working visa. But now they've obviously given like self-employed visas, golden visas, investor visas. It's like you can now even retire here if you want to. Yeah, so, they've opened up a lot more. You can freelance like in terms of, you know, it depend. There's a lot more opportunity to be out here for the longer term and to create a home. Yeah, 100%. And again, like, and I, was, I keep talking about London. I don't want to keep bringing it down, but it's just like that's the easiest comparison for me because I know it. Um, but people thinking about kids and safety and things like that, and it's just like I know at the moment I'd rather my kid grow out out here in terms of the quality of the education, how safe it is for my children to live up, being in a very multicultural society. I'd rather kind of start their life here. Whether they I stay here for forever, I don't know what I'm going to do after that. But for now, where everything is, I think this is one of the best places. Yeah. No, I think I can tell that you're very much set up here for now. You've convinced me. Now, I, you know, I mean, I'm a big advocate. I do really enjoy the buyer. But one of the reasons I wanted to get you on was to really just give a perspective of a different avenue in property. Mm-hmm. We've had a lot of investors on, a lot of developers. We've had people that work in the mortgage sector. But I think it's always important when we have these conversations around property that you know, the, the end goal is effectively building generational wealth. And you can do that through a number of different avenues. So I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, how can people connect with you? People that want to find out more, maybe um, people that want to buy, maybe people that want to move out, maybe people that just need a recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. No Days off DXB on mm-hmm. Instagram. And then on there, you'll see um, WhatsApp, email, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, Mr. No Days off DXB. Appreciate it. So... I mean, there's no days off you're in a suit. I think <laughs> even if I booked this meeting on a suit on a Sunday, would have still been in a suit. On, it's still grafting, which is great to see. Appreciate you having you on. All the best. If you haven't already, make sure you like this video, make sure you subscribe. We're going to be back each and every week because I'm committed to putting out this podcast. No more days off. I've taken a leaf <laughs> out of my good friend's book. So make sure you do subscribe and we'll be back next week with another amazing guest.